The views and opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Natural Bridges Media or KSQD's staff, volunteers, or underwriters. Hello and welcome to Talk of the Bay. I'm your host, Len B.A., and I am very pleased to have as my guest, Jared Childress. Jared Childress is the program manager and burn boss for the Central Coast Prescribed Burn Association for the UC Cooperative Extension. Jared Childress identifies and implements prescribed fire projects throughout San Benito, Monterey, and Santa Cruz counties leads fire-related trainings, and engages various communities for getting good fire onto the ground. Before working for the UCCE, Jared worked as the prescribed fire coordinator for Audubon Canyon Ranch's Fire Forward program, where he was co-founder and co-chair for both the Bay Area Prescribed Fire Council and Sonoma's Prescribed Burn Association, the Good Fire Alliance. Jared is also the sole proprietor of Ember Fire Consulting. Having grown up on a coastal California ranch, Jared's work has centered around the stewardship of California rangelands and the relationships with the people who work them. Jared holds a bachelor's degree in environmental studies with an emphasis on rangeland ecology. He's qualified as a California certified burn boss, a firing boss, an engine boss, and still spends part of his summers fighting wildfires. Jared Childress, welcome to Talk of the Bay. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for coming in. Um, first, I wanted to ask you, for starters, about the history of prescribed burning. Uh, how big a role has it played in the shaping of uh, California's landscape? Yeah, the history of California uh, is intimately tied with uh, intentional burning or planned burning. Um, at least for 15,000 years, uh, the the, the coastal areas of California have seen fire on a regular basis um, every uh, two to eight years. And that's a frequency, or as we say, fire return interval, that is uh, often enough to really determine the ecology that we see and what's adapted to that fire. Um, the, the history itself is really interesting in that most Californians are completely unaware of it. Most Californians only recently became interested in fire after uh, mm. kind of our uh, successive years of firestorms from the uh, 2017 Wine Country Fire and uh, Thomas Fire in Santa Barbara, followed by, of course, the Paradise Fire or the Camp Fire, as it ironically called. And then the, the lightning siege of 2020, which, of course, affected Santa Cruz County very intimately with the CCU complex. And 2021 was another blockbuster year for us here in California. So last year was one of our few uh, uh, years off <laughs> where we got to relax a tiny bit. But there was still some pretty big fires in Northern California, too. Yeah, no kidding. And and so it's in in uh, when we look out at the landscape, it's there evidence of of, you know, generations of fire that preceded uh, colonialization. <clears throat> yeah, so um, on the landscape itself, you, of course, see the the plant communities that evolved with that frequent fire. Um, you have to understand, too, that on the coast, uh, lightning that actually turns into wildfire is quite rare. Um, what we had in 2020 is, a you know, something of an anomaly and not exactly something we see on the yearly um, Really, it seems like the pollen record for this area shows that fire was happening about wildfire was happening about every hundred years pre human uh, introduction of fire. And then um, when we see people being on the landscape, that changes from every hundred years to every two to eight years, even in the, our redwoods. So when you go to a redwood forest that hasn't been logged, you're going to see the blackened charcoal bark. Um, that uh, redwoods, uh, um, because of their resilient ability, their thick bark to withstand fire, um, their bark has that fire scar on it. 
and it's actually one of the ways in which we tell the the fire return interval say 2000 years ago um is by the the uh the scars that are on the redwoods it's actually a really interesting term it's called pyrodendrochronology or uh fire tree time um wow. and when a redwood tree say burns very intensely on one side has a burn scar its uh, bark will start to grow back over, or really its cambium will start to grow back over that charcoalized part and encapsulate that. And so say that tree falls, um, you could then take a cross cut of the, that scar and count backwards, essentially figuring out how old the tree is um, and what years it had fire uh, creating those scars. And so... Um, it's a science in of itself that uh, is done at UC Berkeley quite a bit and um, can give us kind of a, a picture uh, back in time what was the frequency we're seeing. So, for instance, Scott Stevens, who's a fire ecologist at UC Berkeley, um, he was finding that um, up and down the coast, and there are, of course, some anomalies, some areas that really had almost no fire, some areas that had it quite a bit, but generally speaking, redwoods were seeing fire about every eight to 20 years. And this is, you know, within the, the, uh, the, the time scale that we can use this pyrodendrochronology, which is roughly about 1600 years or so. Wow. And, and I know, um, early Spanish explorers, uh, wrote in their journals that they were seeing fires set by the native people pretty frequently as they traveled along the coast. Um, do we yeah. have a sense of how much yeah. fire they they used? Yeah, there's a there's a really great book out there that I'm always kind of a broken record trying to get people to check out. Um, it's ironically called Forgotten Fires, and the reason that's ironic is because most people haven't heard of it. Um, it was uh, put out there by um, um, an anthropologist named Omer Stewart. Um, if I remember right, he first wrote it in the 1930s. And essentially, he wrote it as a way to uh, refute his colleagues who were, um, you know, in their writings pointing out all the indigenous burning in North America, but at the same time saying, well, that wasn't actually a big driver of the local ecology. They would say, oh, it was glaciation or it was, you know, climate or soils and things like this. Hmm. But at the same time, they would point out how common and frequent and how important it actually was for the ecology. So he was essentially... Um, pointing out their inherent racism and their uh, perspective. Mm. So he compiled all of these accounts from uh, the East Coast to the West Coast and everything in between um, in this great book called Forgotten Fires. And it finally got published. Um, it took about 20 years for it to get published in the 1950s and then was quickly forgotten. And recently it's had a, a revival due to some um, people's efforts like uh, Kat Anderson um, so it's been republished, and um, folks can find it. But in the section about California, when they um, the the Spanish were first doing overland trips in California um, about the 1770s, I think it was the Portola expedition. Um, their scribe um, um, basically pointed out anywhere that wasn't burnt, <laughs> and this is in wow. August and September. And uh, they were pretty clear to point out this was not wildfire. They were clear to point out this was native fire, or as they would probably put it, Indian fires. And, um, um, you know, when they came into, say, the Salinas Valley, if they would find an area that wasn't burnt, they would say, oh, and, you know, at this location, we found good forage for our, our mules and horses by this bend in the river. Um, they specifically pointed out the San Lorenzo River and said that there was uh, an area that was, you know, wet enough and green enough that it hadn't burned. And so, um, oh, and then as they moved up the coast, they pointed out the um, um, uh, uh, grassy nature of the area and the lack of trees with the exception of trees and waterways. And when you move up the coast from Santa Cruz to San Francisco, um, one of the things that probably doesn't stand out is the lack of trees. There are dug fir trees and coyote brush and things like that um, in abundance. And it's pretty well established that the local tribes, um, the Waswas speaking Ohlone, um, were uh, burning uh, 
at least in a good part, due to making grasslands. They wanted healthy grasslands for the the forage it would provide for elk, for deer, um, for small rodents or smammals, as I like to say. Um, huh. um, and then for the seeds, the wildflower seeds. So when we burn, even in a contemporary sense, we get a uh, big response from what we say is forbs or wildflowers. And um, a lot of the wildflowers produced a seed that was edible. And the Spanish referred to this um, kind of edible cereal or uh, wildflower seed cereal as panole because it was the closest thing they had, which was, um, you know, pine nuts being turned into uh, um, a food. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, repetition around the idea that um, acorns were the staple for California natives. And at least it seems like here on the coast, it might have actually been wildflower seeds was one of the main staples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there, there's you know plenty of uh, examples of basketry designed specifically for collecting small seeds. That's yeah, for sure. Just for that. And one thing I'd point out too is that you know we're we're talking in the past tense, and for a lot of tribes, this is not a past tense subject. Um, for tribes I work with uh, up on say the Klamath River area, like the Yurok, um, you know. It's not going inherently onto the landscape and seeing the effects of fire. It's the stories their grandmother told them, and then the fires their grandmother showed them how to do for basketry materials, for instance. So mm. burning hazel to get the right size hazel shoots, um, because if you leave California hazel alone, you get essentially a small tree with, you know, uh, two, three, four, five inch diameter trunks. Um, but if you're making basketry and, um, Hazel is one of the main plants used for uh, what are known as often burden baskets. So big, you know, essentially work backpacks. Right. Um, also for uh, carrying um, young babies, so swaddling um, uh, backpacks. Um, hazel is an important uh, part of that. And you need essentially shoots that are smaller than your pinky finger. Mm. And you get those shoots from uh, two- and three-year-old uh, plants. Um, or two- and three-year-old shoots that have re-sprouted from the plant. Because when you burn it, you actually don't get a new plant. You just get a, um, a coppice or um, a re-sprout of the shoots. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I heard similar stories regarding uh, what's commonly called lomita in New Mex northern New Mexico, that the Pueblo people there would also rely on burning it to get the, the really fine new growth to come up. Sure, and that's, so. that's probably one of the biggest things to kind of understand about fire is that, of course, you know, in a modern sense, it feels very destructive. It feels very um, uh, dangerous, um, you know, and with houses the way we have on the landscape, um, that, of course, makes sense. Um, but from an ecological standpoint, even wildfire, unplanned fire, um, but especially planned fire, it has a reviving effect for the landscape. It takes plants that are kind of, um, uh, you know, maybe slowed down. They've um, maybe they're not producing very much seed. Maybe a lot of the seed is under, a, you know, thatch of last year's grass crop and the past 10 years grass crop. Um, you have your woods that are full of branches and sticks and leaves and, you know, everything of that nature. And it essentially cleans that for you and revitalizes everything, gives it new um, nutrients and essentially gives it a shot in the arm. And so um, you can uh, really utilize fire to promote certain ecology. Yeah. And, and you use the phrase good fire. And obviously something like the CZU complex I mean, it might have had some some positive effect somewhere, at least on the fringes, but we'd call that a very destructive, yeah. very hot fire, very fast moving. Um, so when you talk about good fire, um, what's the difference in how it burns? Like, how would you characterize a good fire versus one that isn't maybe particularly good? Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny that we got kind of... Uh, uh, saddled with these two terms, controlled burning and prescribed fire, because most people really don't have a notion of what that means. And I wish it had been called planned fire, because I think that's very descriptive of what we're doing, right? We're, you know, intensely planning sometimes for a year, year and a half, these burns. And we have objectives that we have. 
we have outcomes that we want to see. We have, you know, we want to reduce, you know, woody material by X percent. We want to promote certain native plants. We want to um, um, not promote certain non-native invasive plants. So there's objectives that we have that um, are important to us, and that's all built into that plan, right? And that plan might be written, and in most cases, in a contemporary sense, it is, but it might be just in somebody's head, and it might be um, something maybe they've even been doing for generations. Um, so good fire is intentional, I think, is the first part of it. And inherently intentional fire is planned fire. Um, again, that doesn't mean that it has to be, um, uh, you know, I've, I've burned on ranches in remote parts of California where the plan literally was in the rancher's head and that rancher is repeating what he had done or she um, with their grandparents since they were kids. And so their plan was what they had been shown as kids and they're repeating that. Um, a lot of tribes work like that too. Um, in more kind of uh, um, populated areas or, um, you know, where you're getting more houses and there's a lot more uh, fire departments and, of course, fear of an escape, things like this, um, you're typically getting a, um, a written plan that outlines what is the kind of good component that is good fire. Right. Yeah. Well, for listeners who are just tuning in, I'm here with Jared Childress. He's program manager and burn boss for the Central Coast Prescribed Burn Association, uh, which, is, uh, as I understand it, is part of UC Cooperative Extension. Um, and Jared, when you, you've been training people and doing prescribed burns, um, what, what are the criteria like? What, do you have, what are the conditions you have to create before you can do a prescribed burn you know, and re- with reasonable expectation of yeah. achieving your goals? Yeah, the first, and this is going to be obvious to anyone listening, I believe, is the first and most important thing is you have to have people who know what they're doing. And in California, uh, we really don't, <laughs> you know, writ large. Um, so you, I like to say we need to be building a culture of good fire. Um, you go to somewhere like Florida where they really never stop burning. Mm-hmm. Even the settler cultures realize the, the importance of burning. Um, both for, um, say, cattle production or for reducing wildfire. And so in Florida, they have, um, they're burning roughly about 2 million acres a year, and no one blinks an eye. Mm-hmm. Um, California, we're burning about 100,000 acres a year, sometimes less. This is in prescribed burns. In prescribed burns, not in yeah. wildfires. These are yeah. intentional planned fires. And, um, it feels like a lot of effort (laughs) and we barely have the capacity to do it because we barely have the people who know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the big things that I focus on is um, creating that culture of good fire. So everything from say talking to the public, like I am right now to putting on trainings for volunteers who want to come learn about these things. And you might ask, well, who are these volunteers? Um, it's really everyone. It's, um, when I first started doing this in 2018, um, I thought we would get people, you know, specifically in land management, um, uh, uh, careers, um, maybe, you know, some of the local ranchers and maybe some of the local fire departments. We're definitely seeing those people, but we're also seeing retired engineers. I don't know what it is about engineers, but they love volunteering for prescribed fire. I think they see a problem and they want to find a solution. We're getting college students who are building their careers. Um, We're getting tribes, of course, being heavily involved. We're getting um, wineries. Anyone really who owns any large piece of land at this point is interested in and doing some type of land management and prescribed fire is one of the best ways of doing that. Um, so we're really seeing kind of everyone under the sun. And then this category that I've dubbed the fire curious, which is actually quite a large portion of the population at this point, because I think people are seeing what's happening in California and really the West. And they're going, why, what is this? What is this story? I'm kind of fascinated by this story. And there's also the element, too, and people might not realize this until they actually come to their first burn or come to their first training, which is, um, as a friend of mine said, you know, humans are the the fire ape. 
Um, we evolved to watch fire. We're intrigued by fire. We evolved with fire. It's one of yes. our main tools, obviously. And in our modern lives, it's essentially been taken away from our, you know, our everyday reality. And so when you're actually around, um, say, you know, 20 acres that are slowly burning, there's a part of your brain that opens up and goes, oh, this is really interesting. And so we get those people as well, of course. Yeah. And, and I've just done a little bit, you know, where you use the weed torch. People mm-hmm. have probably seen this in garden supply stores, um, where I've used the weed torch to burn off stuff in in garden plot. Yeah. And, uh, and it's very interesting, you know, trying to do that, like, when is it ready to burn? Well, it, sometimes right after it turns yellow, there's still too much moisture content. And it's like, yeah, you can burn it if you hold the flame to it. But as soon as you take the flame away, it just goes out. And it takes a while to, for it to even sustain a very slow burn to yeah. get dry enough. And oh, yeah, sure. that was news to me. Like, I had just assumed if it's yellow, it'll burn like crazy. Yeah. And it wasn't necessarily so. It would have to get a lot drier. Yeah, we have days where... If we try to start a burn too early and the humidity is too high, mm. and this is you know bone dry grass, but um, the the ambient relative humidity is high enough that those, as we say, fine fuels absorb enough of that moisture that they just won't light, and so mm. then we wait two hours and then our burn's very successful. So there's 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 a lot of um, thresholds where things are successful or not successful. And then, of course, there's the opposite where you have a threshold. And this is really getting into the prescription of all of this, which is the prescription essentially describes um, what is the coolest end of your prescription where things will actually successfully burn. Mm-hmm. And then what is the hottest end where you can successfully control that burn? But anything beyond that, if it's hotter, drier, windier, mm-hmm. uh, whatnot, you're going to have a hard time controlling that burn. And then what's your Goldilocks desired kind of middle ground? And there are burns where we want a really hot burn. And so our desired might be on the hot end, but honestly, the majority are somewhere right in the middle. And then we have ones where the burn, we actually want it to be on the cooler side. And so, you know, it's a... Um, that's the, that's the actual prescription part of prescribed fire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and we have a lot of um, forested areas and rangeland, for that matter, that where we've had fire su- suppression for, you know, many generations in some cases. Um, it, do, you, do you have to, like, collect that fuel, like, keep it from, keep it from lighting in, a, in an uncontrolled way um, when there's that much yeah. Uh, fuel load? Yeah. So, you know... One of, <laughs> there's a there's a lot to unpack there. Sure. Um, so, one of the funny things is we talk. There's a lot of uh, verbiage around fire suppression being the problem, and I want to poke a hole in that, which is fire suppression obviously can be problematic. So, in an area of say California where you have lots of lightning, that would be natural wildfire, and so you know. You could say have some lightning roll through the Klamath area and start fires, and then the Forest Service is going to go and put those out. Those are natural fires that would have been doing good fire, right, historically. Um, Only within the past hundred years have we been putting out those types of fires. And, um, but again, on the coast where we don't have lightning fires, and then previous a hundred years ago, um, it again, that fire suppression was colonization. Um, the fire that was regularly on the landscape was human fire, was, you know, human planned fire. And so that original suppression was colonization, um, both just from the population dying from disease, the population being enslaved right over here in the mission, right next to us, mm-hmm. right? Um, um, to, uh, uh, Indian burning, as it was called, being outlawed. It was actually one of the first laws in California passed. Uh, there was two. Um, one was uh, no Indian burning, so no uh, prescribed fire being done by Native people. Um, this was right after the gold rush when California became a state. And the second one was no skinny dipping, which um, <laughs> I've heard was um, also a shot at the Native population because the, the main people who were doing skinny dipping were Native people. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, 
but with the the fuel load that we have it we we use this term fuel kind of as a, a catch-all phrase for anything that will burn it's both a a term for dead woody material uh dry grass but then also things that are alive like brush and trees and such um but if they have a low enough live fuel moisture um they're they're still flammable and so we call them fuel within the the fire suppression world and if there's enough um especially uh dead down woody material say in a forested environment yeah we might have to do some fuel reduction before we can do um, a broadcast burn, as we say. Um, typically, when it comes to the control aspect of controlled burning, um, it's the edges that we really care about because that's where you would have an escape inherently, right? Mm. Um, um, so um, we tend to focus more of our prep work on the edge of the burn. So if we, say, have a road as a control line and we have a trail or a hand line, that we put in as the other portion, um, we probably are going to do some chainsaw work, maybe some pile burning beforehand. Um, we're maybe going to remove ladder fuels. Uh, maybe we're going to have a machine like a masticator, which is essentially a chipper on tracks, mm. come through and um, remove some of those ground fuels or at least put those fuels into a chipped state so that we don't have ladder fuels so that the fire would get into the canopies. Um, but we might not be that worried about what actually happens in the middle of a unit. So if you, say, have a 50-acre unit, uh, which, just to put in perspective, that's about 50 football fields, um, it's that first, you know, kind of 50 feet of the edge of the unit that we are um, focusing our attentions on and our prep work on. Right, because um, that's where you don't want it to spread to the areas outside right. of that. Right? And then, yeah. you know, another important thing is people probably have an idea that um, – you know, we, uh, you know, light the bottom of a hillside, stand back, watch it burn, and then when something goes across our control lines, we spray water on it. Um, it couldn't be anything farther from the truth. We a good controlled burn, a good prescribed burn, um, often doesn't even spray. We don't use any water. We might have thousands of gallons of water on hand, if need be but we often don't even use it. Um, it's pretty common at the end of the day that we're just draining the tanks. Um, the reason for that is because our main controls are our prescription, right? So not burning on windy days, not burning on days that are too hot, not burning on days that are too dry. Um, so that's our first control that comes into play. The second is we often start at the highest point and on the downwind side. Fire wants to move uphill and it wants to move with the wind. So we make fire do the opposite. We basically bring fire from the high point down and from the downwind side into the wind. Uh -huh. And so, and then we burn kind of a catcher's mitt along our control lines, what we call a black line. Um, so we're burning the edge of our control line first before we even put fire into the middle. So we're doing that. And then we have various firing patterns, as we call them. Um, where we might, um, say, have three igniters moving on a contour on a hillside um, and burning off a strip. And then once that strip burns off, then we're going to have them move on a contour slightly lower than that strip they just burned off. So the next strip basically burns into the strip that already got burned off. Right. So these are some of the main ways that we control fires. We're essentially, um, you know, fire's predictable in that it's a... Uh, it's a it's an element of sorts. It's a chemical reaction, and so you can know that fire is going to want to go uphill. You can know that fire is going to want to go with the wind, um, and you can use those things to to essentially dictate um, the way it's going to react to the way you put the fire on the ground. Right. Well, we're going to be back with Jared Childress in a minute. We're going to take a short break. Uh, don't touch that dial. We'll be back uh, learning more about prescribed burn and the all the ups and downs and hot and cold of fire. So uh, don't go away. You're listening to Talk of the Bay on K Squid. I'm your host Len Ba, and my guest is Jared Childress, and uh, we're gonna feed you a little music about fire here real quick and we'll be right back with more uh of our conversation about 
prescribed burns. Whitey Morgan, I'm on fire. And we're talking about fire here with Jared Childress. He is a program manager and burn boss for the Central Coast Prescribed Burn Association for the UC Cooperative Extension and is uh, uh, has worked as a prescribed fire coordinator uh, and trainer. Um, Jared, we've, we've been talking a lot about the benefits and, and how you conduct prescribed burns. Um, and you explain that you know some plants are fire adapted. That is, they'll they'll live through fire or they'll reseed from fire. I assume some plants don't survive fire very well. What's how does that break out? Yeah, a good example of that is um, Douglas fir, which is a common uh, uh, native California tree, um, and um, its seedlings are not fire adapted. Um, they can't handle very much heat. They, they perish from it. Um, and uh, the adults are decently adapted to, to fire. Um, if you get a really hot uh, kind of August burn like we had with the CZU complex, the adults often won't make it. So we had a lot of very large dug fir trees not uh, survive. So if you say go to Big Basin, um, at the main park entrance where the old growth is, um, the big dug firs, a lot of them perished, um, whereas a lot of the redwoods did not because the redwoods uh, re-sprout after fire, what's called epicormic sprouting, even a really hot fire. Um, so uh, historically, fire was used to keep uh, dug firs from Douglas fir from moving into areas that were not Douglas fir forest. So I used to work in Sonoma County and Mendocino counties. You have a lot of um, uh, black oak and valley oak and those areas, blue oak as well. Um, without fire, you get Douglas fir moving into those woods mm. and they can actually grow through the canopy of the oak trees and start to shade them out, what we call piercing. And they'll actually overtop the oak trees and eventually um, choke out those oak trees and you'll lose your oak forest. And that's actually wow. happening in a big, big way from uh, Humboldt County, um, actually up into Oregon as well in the Willamette and uh, uh, um, the Puget Sound area uh, with Oregon oak in that area. Um, and as a big... Um, uh, change that's happening on the local ecology and historically fire would have been the thing that kept that in check and so and right. very obviously that was one of the reasons why native people were burning was to keep douglas fir kind of in check now there's areas where douglas fir doesn't burn because you can't get a fire really to go <laughs> ah. um, a north slope down by a creek right it's going to be too wet too shaded too cool um uh, historically, a prescribed burn, you know, an indigenous burn in August would have just gone out in those riparian areas or those north-facing cool areas. Mm. Um, and so that's where you historically saw your Douglas fir trees. Um, here on the coast, um, up by, say, Anunuevo, uh, Costa Noa, uh, that area, um, there is the Caroste Valley, which is um, 
uh, a native village site for the um, um, the Karoste Awaswas. And historically, yeah. that was an open grassland with oak trees in the canyons. Now you go there and it's um, a, it looks like a, uh, a, a fir plantation in Scotland um, where, you know, trees are cheek to jowl. They are crowding each other out. And when I say trees, I mean Douglas fir. And so, again, historically, fire would have kept those trees in check. Um, a friend of mine actually dubbed them the bully of the woods because left to their own devices, Douglas fir will actually take over a forest. And there's other trees in California that will do the exact same, native trees. Mm. So I grew up in the East Bay Hills, and we have a lot of uh, live oak forests there. And um, um, there it's bay laurel. Bay laurel is the next succession. Um, it likes wet, cool areas, and fire would have kept it in check because bay laurel is very flammable. And um, um, now that we've taken fire off the landscape, we're getting bay trees piercing through the oak canopy, shading out the oak trees, and um, there a lot of our live oaks are being lost to bay, yeah. bay and laurel. I see that right here in the hills around Santa Cruz. Sure, yeah. 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 Wow. So um, obviously some, some plants are killed, some are killed but will recede. Um, what happens to all the the animals, like the insects, reptiles, birds, mammals, when when there's a you know even f I'm thinking even of a prescribed burn? Like yeah, what sure. happens to those creatures? Yeah, uh, you know, fire is obviously something that can injure things. So, you know, it would be a fallacy to say that uh, um, a burn uh, never harms any critter, but the reality is as most uh, species in California um, uh, do a thing called estivate during the dry season and when we can burn, it's often still that estivation period. Estivation is essentially hibernating during the dry season and um, so for a lot of species, they're underground or um, if they're something like a, you know, a woodland nesting bird, their nests are high enough that they're up out of the um, the burn area, or it's you know say the fall and it's not nesting season, and so they're able to just fly a little ways. Um, and then the majority of our burns are pretty slow. Um, again, you know the controlled nature of it means that we're kind of moving slowly. Um, so it's pretty common to um, kind of do a firing pattern so that if an animal was in the burn unit, they could just move out of the burn unit. So for instance. Last year when I was burning with state parks at Wilder State Park, we would make sure that we wouldn't ring a meadow with fire. We would maybe do a U-shaped firing pattern and then slowly start burning out the middle so that there was that opening on the downhill side so that, you know, if, say, a, uh, a doe and fawn were in the meadow, they could just go out that way. Oh, yeah. Great. That's and, – and, and relying on their – their instincts and and capacity for for uh, getting away is yeah and there's one other safe bet. point i'll 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 say which is um obviously and there's good reason for this um there's a lot of worry about endangered species in california right now um being a kind of a hot spot for diversity we have a lot of those species and we're kind of stuck in a <laughs> between a rock and a hard place where um the the species can't ha be harmed, say, by an intentional fire, hmm. but where we see the species doing the best is often in wildfire areas. So an example of that is the Smith's blue butterfly, um, which is found in Monterey Bay and down in the Big Sur area. It's a federally listed endangered species, um, very beautiful little um, butterfly. And um, it is entirely associated with two types of native buckwheat. And uh, it spends mm. its entire life cycle within 200 yards of these buckwheat stands. Um, and there's not much known yet right now. And this is, this is a, a hole in the research that needs to happen, uh, be filled. And, um, but we don't really know what is the right time of year for burning in this buckwheat, if there's a better season or a worse season for these species. But what we do know is the best populations that we see are in the Sobranes fire footprint, which was in 2016. And the other thing we know is 
uh, native buckwheats love fire. They respond very vigorously to fire. They re-sprout post-burn with lots of vigor and flowers. Their seeds are, you know, stimulated by the fire, and you get lots of new uh, plants growing up. And so for a, 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 an endangered butterfly that needs that buckwheat, again, its entire life cycle is associated with it. More buckwheat means more Smith's blue butterfly. So we're kind of stuck in this place where we know that these species are adapted to fire. We know that they need fire, but because they're an endangered species, we can't harm them with fire. And so there's huh. this catch 22 going that on is there. A catch and it's one that actually uh, Fish and Wildlife knows about. It's one that they're slowly educating themselves about. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one that us fire managers are not only ourselves learning more and more about, but we're trying to get fish and wildlife to kind of grasp this. But there's a lot of examples of this. Um, yeah. California red legged frogs fit into that category. Uh, San Francisco garter snake, if you ask me, fits into that category. So there's a lot of uh, very important and endangered species where we should be burning for their health, but we can't because they're endangered. (laughs) Yeah, I read an environmental journal article. I unfortunately don't remember the species, but there are a couple of species of birds that seem to thrive in post-fire habitats, particularly um, with, with, uh, you know, burned snags. Yeah, and Uh, and the reality is, is, you know, for a landscape that burned for hundreds of thousands of years, and then when humans came to the scene, started burning very, very regularly for 15,000 years, that's a lot of time. <laughs> that's, a, that's so much time that we really can't comprehend it. Right. And to deny that landscape something that it was profoundly evolved with is like denying it rain. And one of the things we see immediately and i don't mean you know the next day after a burn i mean once the flames have moved through you know and you still have smoldering ash and you still maybe have a stick on fire over here a stick on fire over there guess what we see we see wildlife coming right back into these areas Mm -hmm. we see deer rolling in the ashes these are probably deer that maybe have never seen fire in their life but they some part of their evolutionary makeup understands that when they roll in ashes um, a lot of the um, the parasites that are on them, the ticks and fleas and things, don't like that ash and, and fall off. Um, we see uh, raptors and crows and ravens hunting in the burned out areas. Mm. You almost always see ravens traveling in packs post burn looking for um, crickets that have uh, mm. burned up. And... Um, you see uh, the raptors looking for any kind of mouse or any kind of smammal that's, you know, perished, that they can get a, you know, a hot snack, essentially. You see coyotes coming through. And I, again, I'm talking, you know, an hour after. Like while it's still burn. smoldering. Yes. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, so it's, 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 a lands- it's a landscape that knows fire. It's a landscape that needs fire. And we've denied it, <laughs> which is a problem. Yeah. Wow. And, and you mentioned earlier, like, what, there's kind of a shortage of people who know what they're dur- doing when it comes to prescribed burning. And there's at least a couple of fires I can think of. Um, one that was in uh, New Mex- northern New Mexico just last yep. year that started as a prescribed burn and got out of control. Yep. Um, so, like, what's what's the <laughs> need for training? Um, you know, what's do you know what they did wrong? Or yeah. is it is yeah. it more complicated it's, because of the history of <clears throat> suppressing fire? Yeah, the Hermit Peak Fire, as it got called. Yeah. Um, so the Hermit Peak Fire is a really interesting case study. So there's a, there's a, a write-up on it, what happened. Um, the write-up conspicuously doesn't mention – oh, that's my dog shaking. Um, <laughs> Remington Tanglefoot. Um <laughs> the write-up conspicuously doesn't mention what the weather was doing, which I think is the most important part of mm. it. So when you're um, deciding when to burn, um, the hardest thing to to not do <laughs> is pick a date. Everyone wants you to pick a date. Um, nice. The only time I ever pick a date is, <clears throat> is if we're doing a training. So I know that we're going to have a class and I need to advertise the class. And we're going to be having students there. Um, And we still might not burn because if the weather's not right, we're not going to burn. Um, But the best thing to do is pick your weather. And you really can't pick your weather 
more than a week, week and a half out. So it means you need to be flexible. Um, And as far as I can tell in New Mexico, they had some type of pressure that I'm not sure what it was to make a burn happen and the weather wasn't right. It was technically within their prescription, but their prescription went as low as uh, uh, the relative humidity as low as 9%, which is exceedingly rare. We we rarely ever burn lower than uh, 15, 20%. And so when you're in that 9% range, you're in wildfire territory. And actually the RH got down to 6%, um, which is again, about as low as it gets. <laughs> so it's yeah. it's literally burning on the driest day possible. Their test burn, which is we we do a thing called a test burn to see if the burn is going to actually burn, to see if it's going to burn in the way that we want it to, um, and to see if, like, are we going to have any problems. And the test burn needs to be big enough that it tells you good information, but it needs to be small enough that you could put it out no problem. Um, So it tends to be, you know, maybe the size of a basketball court or something like that, you know, half acre or less. And during their test burn, they had trees torching. And when you have trees torching, a.k.a. the canopy catching on fire, during your test burn, that tells you you have extreme fire conditions. Yes. And That's some the fact that they kept vegetation. moving forward is very problematic. So I think the other thing, too, was they had 60-mile-an-hour um, winds the day before. <sighs> and they had pretty strong winds the day of, about 20 miles an hour. And it was a a forest, so the forest is going to dampen those winds, but it was a somewhat open forest, so how much did it actually dampen it? And my guess is, and this is just me guessing, they were in a pretty remote part of a national forest, and so I think they just weren't that concerned if it got out of the unit, Hmm. because I think all the information was there at the start to tell them it was going to get out of their burn unit. They probably felt that they could control it, even if it was out of the burn unit. There was a big rocky, uh, kind of a craggy um, cliff just above the burn unit, so they probably Mm -hmm. felt like it couldn't go that way. And in the end, they were able to corral it um, away from any type of population um, at about 1,000 acres, which sounds like a, a big escape, which technically it is, but in a remote area, that's maybe not that big of a deal. The real problem was there was a second burn that rekindled from piles from the January before, and this was in May, if I remember right. So quite a a long time after. And that rekindle blew up in a windstorm and ran into the escape burn. So um, really, they they had an escape that was about 1,000 acres, which would be small enough that none of us would have ever heard about it in California. Um, But then once it got... um, out of their control officially and the wildfire season was on it and the heavy winds and dry conditions, then it got really big and did a lot of damage and burnt down quite a few um, houses. And so I, I think really the lesson there is why were they pushing the envelope, right? Why were they pushing the envelope of their prescription? Why were they burning in such a dry time um, when they knew there was a you know years long drought, why when they had their um, test burn and they had trees torching, did they continue? Right, these are the really the the questions. And unfortunately, the write up that was done, the investigation, I don't feel like really addressed any of those. Mm. Yeah, it didn't really answer those questions. So you know, we have lots and lots of really good burn days here in coastal California. Um, days where we have, you know, kind of a, a medium, <laughs> medium temperatures, medium humidity, medium winds, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, where we don't need to be burning on these extremes because when you burn closer to the extremes, that's when you have problems. Yeah. As you said, finding the sweet spot. Yeah. So you've, you know, I think most people listening to this show have never been participated in a prescribed burn unless maybe just a burn pile in their yard. Um, but you've been on lots of them. And I, I, I wondered if you could, you know, if there's one in particular that comes to mind that uh, you think is, you know, maybe of most interest or might have been a, the be- best learning experience for you. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, that's a hard thing to pin down. Um, um 
So last fall, um, I had the pleasure of getting to attend um, some prescribed burns in Yurok territory, which is the lower Klamath River. Um, I have some friends that uh, run a prescribed fire program and are part of the tribe there. And um, there was people from all over helping with the burns as part of a training exchange, as we call them, or a treks. And um, my role on the fire that day was what's called firing boss, a.k.a. a person who is kind of overseeing the the, the group of people or who are putting fire on the ground and making sure that it's happening in a, a coordinated and safe way. And um, our overhead, the people who were in charge kind of um, uh, of our side of the fire and then our burn boss, the person who's, you know, kind of overseeing the whole burn, they were from outside the area. And um, the, the locals, both native and white, were really frustrated with these um, these overhead uh, people because they were so afraid of burning. They were so afraid of what fire was going to do on the landscape. And um, of course, the locals, especially the native folks who've been you know burning their entire life up there, um, they're not afraid of fire. They don't have that fear. They don't see it as a negative. They see it as good, right? The good fire component. And the overhead conspicuously, and I've used that, you know, not in seriousness, um, (laughs) they were all coming from fire suppression backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to be in the public and think firefighter equals fire lighter or firefighter equals fire practitioner. And it sometimes is true and it can be true. And there's obviously a lot of parallels there. But if you spend your entire career fighting fire and putting fire out, you might still be afraid of fire. It, it often goes hand in glove and it doesn't mean that you ever got taught how to put fire on the landscape. Um, and so you still might not know how to do that. Well, if you're labeled a firefighter, the hardest thing in the world to admit is I'm not very good at burning things, (laughs) right? (laughs) You know, it's hard to say, Oh, I'm really good at putting them out, but I'm not good at, lighting them because you have that that name fire in your title right and um, so that's why you hear that term starting to be used fire lighter versus firefighter right because there are people now who they've spent a career lighting fire and not fighting it and so those things can go hand in hand but they can also be separate and so on this burn we had the overhead um really kind of breathing down the firing team's throat about, you know, don't put too much fire on the ground, you know, you know, you know, hold back. We got to keep these trees from uh, burning up. You know, we need to make sure these trees live. You know, they were referring to uh, Doug fir trees that were probably about 50 years old, which in that area is dime a dozen. And um, people really want to reduce the amount of Doug fir because they've encroached on the landscape. Um, they were referring to them as grandfather trees. You know, this is a 50 year old tree, right? (laughs) Um, and which for that area where, you know, uh, an actual grandfather dug for would be about 500 to 700 um, years old. Klamath river. Yeah. 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 And, um, so there was just a disconnect of what was wanted. And finally we got to this meadow that I knew we wanted to burn hot because the meadow was being approached upon by Himalayan, blackberry which is a non-native invasive they wanted to burn this meadow for um uh, elk habitat and um um also forage for their horses and um so we decided okay we're gonna do what's called flanking fire which is that we bring fire straight down the hillside through in a you know everyone in a row through this meadow and really put a lot of heat on this meadow to get it to to burn out the blackberries and so we did just that, and um, the the native folks were the happiest I've seen them all week because they had been grumpy all week because they were feeling like they were just being kind of ridden by this mm. these two guys on overhead. And so to see people who understand fire, understand the right um, the right amount to put on the landscape at the right time with the right weather. And to see that kind of joy that it brings is really um, 
um, exciting and enlightening. Yeah, that's that's great, and and what a difference it makes. Well, we just have a couple minutes left, um, but I want to ask you. You know, you you grew up on a ranch. Um, how did you come to doing um, prescribed burn work? Yeah, um, like most good stories, it's not a short one, so <laughs> I'll try to uh, keep it short. Um, but um, if anyone out there has ever heard of the little town of Canyon, that's where I grew up. It's about three hundred people in the Oakland Hills, and. Um, uh, the ranch that I grew up on, John McCosker Ranch, um, caught fire in the Oakland Hills firestorm of uh, 91. Um, I was 13 years old, and um, when we called uh, the local fire department to see if anyone could respond, the fire department phone just rang and rang and rang and rang. No one was there. Right. And they're already on the the main burn, you know, which at the time was becoming California's most destructive fire, both deadly and from a property standpoint. And this was a smaller spot fire, so it was essentially getting ignored. And um, so at a certain point, certain neighbors decided, okay, we're going to go out and try to fight it where we can. Some neighbors packed up and left. Um, Looking back on it... um, um, we essentially didn't know what we were doing and we got lucky, you know, when it came to, um, um, a being able to actually do anything. It was mostly in the grass and the winds had mostly died down and the humidities had come up. So things were moving slower. If it was earlier in the wildfire, um, it could have been really dangerous. So again, we got lucky and I don't advocate anyone going out and doing this, but, um, that's how I got into fire. I was 13 years old. Um, I got given a shovel. I was told to go stomp out all the cow patties that were reigniting the grass. And so I went around and, you know, jumped up and down on, uh, uh, hot cow patties (laughs) and had a grand old time. And, um, you know, someone pointed out to me, you can get paid to do this, which I didn't know at the time. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. So, um, out of high school, I ended up taking some classes at MPC and um there were uh from there i ended up working for cal fire it was then it was called cdf for two yeah. seasons up in sonoma and then uh worked on ranches doing land management and went to prescribe burns when i could and that's how i got into it fabulous well jared childress it's been really great and interesting having you on the show i wish we had more time and um and uh, thank you so much for being here and for for your work, and especially in helping to spread knowledge yeah, and about would, prescribed burns. I would just say if anyone's interested in uh, participating in trainings, coming to burns, um, check out CalPBA, so C-A-L-P-B-A dot org. It's kind of the landing spot for all the PBAs starting in California. Great. Thank you again.